Okay, if we can uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, again, good morning and uh, welcome to the um, Tuesday, May 25th workshop meeting of the Barefoot Bay Recreation District Board of Trustees. Uh, we have a very short agenda today. We will please stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gruno, would you please call the roll? Mr. Loveland. Here. Mr. Gruno, here. Mr. Marcy. Here. Mr. Nugent. Here. Chairman Mino. Here. Also note that we have our community manager, John Coffey, our district clerk, Stephanie Brown. We have our council, Clifford uh, Reppinger. And in the audience, we have Rich Armington from DOR and HR and Charles Henley from uh, Finance. We have a quorum. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any letters, Mr. Coffey? Any calls? No? We have no audience participation. Audience participation, just full house today. Audience participation is closed. Agenda. Mr. Chairman, if we had an audience, could we have 15 minutes at the end for audience participation? To, we don't have an audience. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, sure, that's fine. Um, you, 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 you had me there for a minute. I thought, if they're not going to speak now, what are they going to say later? <laughs> okay. All right, what's our agenda? Role of general counsel in relation. Well, I'm not sure how we start this. Uh, Mr. Coffey, do you start? Do we start? How do we do? Either way. I guess let me just start by throwing some things out. Uh, we're here today to talk about legal fees and legal costs and, and um, uh, the role of the council in relationship to the BOT, uh, benefits of legal services, what do we get for what we go out there and do. Um, uh, what we pay for, for some of the DOR violations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to make sure that everybody understands this is not a, not a criticism of, of our attorney as much as it came about, at least from my perspective, when we started doing the budget, and I'm not too much backlash here, is it? No. Uh, when we started doing the budget, um, I started looking at every single thing that we have in a budget because I'm used to doing that from when I was a school superintendent. And I mean you look at every single item uh, from food services to golf courses to, to, to what we spend on travel to benefits, uh, what salaries are. And again, legal services came up. And the first thing you noticed was that we spend a lot of money on legal services. The second thing is we then... And, and so it's something that you have to look at and say, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it something we should be doing? Uh, the second thing is we have so many cases that come up with DOR, data restriction violations, and <clears throat> we continue to hear about them, and I don't really understand them, and I have to apologize. I don't really understand exactly how it all works. I don't really know exactly what we get for all the things that we, the cases that we bring, all the filings that we make. Um, again, the, the question came up, what does it cost for some of those things, and what are we getting back? Um, we've had a couple cases where we close them and all of a sudden find out that people can't pay anyway, but we spent money, a lot of money, on those cases. So, so in my perspective, that's how this came about, where I wanted to start looking at our legal services. Um, it's not that we don't need them. It's not that we don't... And again, I look at legal services possibly different than they look at legal services on, on, a, on a group like this or maybe a county commission or a, or a city commission um, because we looked at legal services and, you know, my school district, we used to spend three or $400,000 a year. Um, but we used legal services for legal opinions and never ever had attorneys at meetings and, and you know, we did built buildings and all kinds of things. You would bring them to those, to those meetings for specific things. 
So it's not to say that we are doing anything wrong. It's simply that I don't understand sometimes the way we do things and what, what we do. So I, I, I'm not sure if I confused it more or not, but I, I want to make sure we understand it. So to start, does anybody else have any comments or questions or indication of how we go? Yeah, well, I, I have a, a concern about uh, the way that uh, legal uh, uh, program is, you know, to contact the, uh, in contacting legal services from the board standpoint or individual standpoint. Uh, it seems that uh, any time that somebody had a question about something uh, that I look was aware of that it was a, 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 a answer to a legal question of how or why or what we can do. And uh, I, I, my, my thought was that there might be a liaison to the uh, legal counsel that you'd have to go through before you, you know, uh, ask for an opinion or maybe work it out before it has to be a legal matter, you know? so. In that respect, I think that would be a, a cost saving, uh, perhaps, in the long run. And that was the only uh, thing that I thought about it when I looked at the uh, report and the... the um, Good point. I, I, and again, I, I, I forgot summary. two issues as I, as I opened up. There were two issues. One of them is that it's, it's that, um, th again, the way our, Mr. Coffey, and the way our staff uses legal services, which is different than what I was used to, and not wrong, just different. So uh, again, you look at it. And the other thing was, of course, um, we had the issue of the attendance cliff, I think, at one of those meetings where, you know, we had a little disagreement about whether or not we should have legal services at that meeting when you couldn't attend. And mm -hmm. um, I think that then started me looking at attendance at meetings and what we get for it. So I have mm -hmm. lots of questions about those kinds of things. Uh, anyone else? Qu questions, comments? Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Oh, okay. go ahead. Mr. Gruno, go ahead. At the university that I retired from, unless the situation involved the dean, you had to run your request for legal services past the dean before you went to legal services. Serve two things. One, somebody else knew there was an issue. Two, was it as bad of an issue that you thought it was? Mr. Nugent. Yeah, I mean, not only the location that I was in, but also the municipality I lived in, we never had general counsel present at the Board of Selectmen's meeting, which was, in essence, the Board of Trustee meeting. Um, if we had a legal question that came up during the discussion, we would table it. We would get the opinion of general counsel the following day or whenever, wasn't any one of the selectmen that contacted the legal counsel directly. It was the uh, town manager or the community manager. So we did not have free access to general counsel. And um, second of all, general counsel was not present at every meeting unless we thought that there was going to be a discussion that involved needing the attorney present. And, and um yeah, let me uh, respond to that to him before Cliff or anyone else does. You know, just so you guys know, we, we do have a contract with our attorney, and it specifically states what we do and how the attor what the attorney does and what, they, what, what he should be. And it is in the contract that he will attend every meeting of the uh, Barefoot Boy Board of Trustees. So that's number one. It's, it's nothing that, that th they shouldn't be doing because it is in the contract that he does it. Um, um, the question I had, of course, and, and it was a difference of opinion, and it has to do with relationship of, of legal counsel to the board. At the one meeting when we had, um, and I don't remember her name, Cliff, is it Chris something? Krista Runty. Kristen, yeah. When she was going to come to the meeting, and I know I had a couple of back and forth emails with Cliff. First he was not going to come, and then he was going to come. And at that particular point, I didn't think that was necessary, and it wasn't because there was absolutely nothing that she she had to do with the meeting, um, or that we even had to ask. And and it was a difference of you know. The, and again, I go back and look at the contract. Um, legal services represents the entire board, 
and or the board as a whole and you know we had two or three members or at least three who did not want representation one member did and we ended up having representation I disagree with that completely um, so one of the things I would want to look at in the future is not necessarily whether we have t council at our meetings but for sure whether we have um, uh, representation of other attorneys at the meeting if Cliff cannot attend I'm, unless there's a specific issue that we are going to address that needs legal concern, um, I, I'm going to look in the future that we may not necessarily, I would not be in favor of that. But that's just one issue. But it is in the contract, specifically states as to what our attorneys do and what their jobs and responsibilities are. Yeah, um, <coughs> yeah, I'll speak now. At that meeting, you said that we did not re reference Krista uh, Mr. Mino, I'm, I'm sorry, but you're incorrect. We referenced her three times. If you go back and look at that meeting, you will find where we referenced her three different times for legal opinion. For uh, legal before opinions? Moving forward. Yes, sir. Uh, just look at the meeting. Um, I did not bring notes to um, banner it, but we did. We referenced her three times, and I thought the irony of that was it, it, it was not lost on me whatsoever. The other thing is, is that, you know, we all have sat on boards and we all have had careers and we all have had many things that we have done in our life. And, and I'm assuming all of them have been successful, uh, whether that be golf or sitting on a school board or a medical board or a bank board. Uh, but we were also all trained, and our, or I would hope, that we were trained to be very good at those jobs. This job, for me... And I, I by no means feel that I'm an unintelligent person, but by no means was this an easy job to sit down into and know the nuances of not only just county, but what our voting rights are and what our legal rights are within our community and what we can and cannot do and when a misstep or uh, not a misstep. So, therefore, yes, I am comfortable with uh, counsel at all of our meetings, and I will not, I, I'll tell you now, I will not be attending any of our board meetings without counsel. And if that means it requires my resignation, you may have that today. Well, and that's fine. And, and again, everybody makes choices as to what they want to do. Um, I don't agree with that at all. Um, uh, when I look at the costs and what we spend for and, and Cliff, you can jump in any time you want. This is this is not a. But let me just let me just answer that. You know, again, when I look at costs and and I look at the, at the fact that in 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 2019 we spent 112,911 dollars on legal, and in in 2020 we spent 133,029 dollars and seven cents on legal. In three months of 2021, we spent 45,137 dollars on legal, 15,000 a month we're averaging. When you look at meeting costs in 220, and if you look at what it costs for reviewing agendas, calling somebody up and about an agenda, um, not having that legal issue necessarily even on the agenda, and we're spending $1,120 at a meeting, $1,102 for a meeting, $997, $1,140. If you go back and look at all the things we do, I still think it's something you have to look at and say, wait a minute. Um, I understand we, uh, and at the meeting you talked about with Kristen, I referenced one time something that could I do it, and I almost did it sarcastically because I knew I could. Uh, and it was just kind of a, uh, a thing saying, you know, I don't really need someone here to tell me whether I can do that or not because I know I can. Um, I just still think it's something you have to look at in a district like ours where we have a $5,000 bill, uh, um, $5 million or $6 million budget, um, and, and, and we're spending $1,000 a meeting between attendance at meetings of legal service and reviewing agendas, et cetera, before the meeting. That's a lot of money. And I think that's something that still has to be looked at. Hey, Mr. So Chairman, can, jump in can, can I jump in? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a if I could just start the discussion, and you're talking about a lot of different things, so, um, right. um, but just to give you a, a, just a general statement and then kind of frame it back to where you're at right now and where I think the discussion should be uh, centered, um, th there's a whole laundry list of things that we do as far as legal services that I was prepared to address as part of the first agenda item that I'm not going to get into, um, uh, but 
if you if you bring it back, and, and it's not lost on me the the concepts of what you're talking about that there is quite a bit of expense related to meetings and 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 preparation for meetings and attending of the meetings. So if we if we just center there um, for a second, as you stated in the contract, it says that we're supposed to attend the meetings. That was what that that was what we originally contracted for. And since I came to the district in 2007, that has been the expectation is that our office attends the the every meeting, and we've been doing that for 14 years. Um, uh, unless the board directs otherwise. Um, there isn't really a set way that all jurisdictions do it. I think most of your local political subdivisions in Brevard County, most of them in the state of Florida, are going to have legal counsel at their meetings. Um, it's a pretty common practice to do that. Um, do you have to have it at every meeting? No, you don't, because you don't have an issue raised at every single meeting, but sometimes you do, and you never know where it's going to come from. Um, within the scope of the laundry list of things that we do, as I stated, when you're in a meeting, you never know when, are those, when one of those things might pop up. Or if you're pre-screening an agenda, sometimes I might catch an item that could be that could present a legal issue, where I consult with staff or you know consult with Mr. Coffey uh, in advance, or perhaps uh, the chair or, or whatever. If I identify an item that's going to come, or sometimes Mr. Coffey will call me and say, "Hey, I think we're going to have this issue. So if you could be prepared to address the legal end of it, um, that would be great." That's not going to happen every meeting, of course, um, but but. But when I'm there, I, at least I can address the things that do come up. Um, the reason why I sent Krista to the meeting that I couldn't be at was, again, as you've identified, that we had a contractual obligation. Um, at least one of the trustees did not feel comfortable moving forward with the meeting, and I felt like as a just professionally – uh, under the contract because it was a last minute cancellation that I hadn't advised the board about beforehand, um, that I had a contractual obligation to send somebody and a, a legal uh, uh, and ethical obligation to send Krista to cover the meeting. Krista is kind of my backup um, person on all uh, uh, Barefoot Bay matters. And so um, she's very familiar with the governing docs. She's very familiar with agendas and, and she's certainly capable of addressing issues. So I felt like that was an appropriate thing to do. Um, but, and, and you can take staff input on this if you want, it, you know, if, if the board doesn't feel like you want to have legal counsel at every meeting, you are the bosses, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that um, from my standpoint if that's the directive of the board, that you don't want us at every meeting, or maybe you want us at one meeting a month, or maybe, you know, a, as needed, whatever it is. What I would caution you about and what I would tell you is that the issues that get that arise during meetings and the things that are on your agenda kind of flow over from meeting to meeting and into and into issues that carry forward into uh, management and practice and it does help it is very helpful to be here and be present to hear what those issues are to kind of see the evolution of issues and how they get a, how they get uh, uh, raised what's really at issue um, um, to be able to kind of start at least uh, conceptually analyzing those issues uh, uh, and, and, and thinking about how they're going to present themselves moving forward. If I'm not here and I don't hear some of those discussions and I don't know what your positions are on issues or I'm not seeing what the, what the matter of the day that's uh, of concern is, there's going to be a learning curve that – will have to happen if Mr. Coffey or one of the staff has to call me or one of the trustee or chairman has to call me and say, hey, I want to bring you up to speed on this issue. There's definitely going to be a learning curve of trying to figure out, okay, what is the issue? What's going on? You know, and Okay, but Cliff, in, in, in this exact good point. Let, let me interrupt you because, and then go right with what you're doing. Sure. So, so that comes to, I guess, the point of what is the role of the legal. Okay. What you're talking about, though, is more have, of you – of you assuming almost more of a role of a trustee rather than someone who gives a legal opinion on a legal issue. And well, that's, I'm, that's I'm, the point that I don't quite no, understand. And, 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 I'm not, and I'm not saying that I have to be involved in the discussion. What I'm saying is, is that as your legal advisor, as your counsel, it's important for me to factually have knowledge about what is going on in order to be able to advise you accurately when the legal question comes. If I'm not aware of what's going on, 
it's harder to give you proper advice because I don't really know what all of the fact issues are. Sometimes, you know, even in translation, if something's told to me, I may not see it the same way as if I'm hearing it factually in person and I understand what all the issues are so that I can give you an accurate legal opinion. Sure, Mr. Coffey. Uh, and I'm not, what I'm about to say is not the way it has to be, but because Cliff and I can leave and new people will come in. But remember, Cliff is an integral part of the way my leadership team manages and operates Barefoot Bay. He's not a person who sits out there and we reach out, should we do X or Y? He's integral to our daily operations. That may not be what the board wants going forward, and you're welcome to give us direction, but that's how I operate. And my success the last seven and a half years is based on having Cliff an integral part of our team. He's a colleague of mine. He's not one of my managers, but he's a colleague that we uh, rope in on critical issues early because, A, I trust his judgment, and um, my experience has been um, if you don't rope him in early, it just takes more of his time going forward, the Chits is an example. Um, a couple, couple years ago, um, Cliff and Charles did a little research. They real summary reviewed it with Cliff. Cliff said it seemed reasonable. We fast forward. A couple of you did not like that direction. Cliff and um, his assistant has spent a lot of time digging through the details and the research after the fact. The other thing I would just caution the board, and how you run the board is up to you, but since three of you are relatively new, if we start deferring things on the agenda and deferring things on the agenda, the folks in the audience will start getting unhappy because that's what the a board about three, four years ago kept deferring things, deferring things. So no matter how you operate your board, folks in the audience are going to criticize. That's the third rail of Barefoot Bay politics. But I just wanted to let you understand, um, Cliff is not an outside observer who we just ask a question and we go forward. Um, he's integral to the way I operate. And, and well, I'm going to have to... Green light. What is green light? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. I suppose so. There okay, you go. it's You're on now. Um, and, and that, John, it's a very good point, and that's exactly the point I think we're talking about because I, you're right. I don't think everyone looks at it the way you're looking at it, that he's, he's, he's like an additional staff member almost. Um, and and, and, I, and I'm, I, I agree with you. That is exactly the point that this board, if in any way they want to change things, would, would have to look at and say, is that true? Uh, again, being an integral part of the decision-making here, I'm concerned that sometimes it doesn't go to the point where he is tr influencing or suggesting or whatever, even with some residents, um, things that should be done that are BOT decisions and not legal decisions. Um, I, and again, when you talk about being up to speed on things, you know, we're, we're looking at, and, and I don't mean to nitpick, but, it's, but it is all part of this. When you look at we're, we're starting a, a meeting for an agenda, and so it costs $87.50 to uh, uh, look at the, the agenda for a BOT meeting. Then they're going to review agenda again. It's another $175. Continue reviewing the agenda, preparing for BOT meeting, $262. $87 for a telephone conference about the agenda item and $595 to sit at the meeting. Mm -hmm. It was no legal issues at that meeting. That's a that's $1,120 for a meeting, and there were no legal issues. Well, I, I don't want to go back and say there are no legal issues. It wasn't something that we were specifically doing. I, I guess I still think those kinds of things have to be looked at and say um, it may be an integral part of, of, of the way the operation is run, but if that's it, then we have, we have got to acknowledge, say, yeah, we've got another uh, uh, staff member. Um, 
uh, the highest paid staff member we've got on the on the thing, and and if that's it, then that's what we agree to do. Uh, I'm just not used to doing that, and I'm not comfortable doing that because I don't think legal services should ever get to a point where they are acting more like a staff member or a BOT member. I uh, well, that's just my opinion. And Cliff, go ahead with where you were. I'm if sorry. I, if I could just address that issue, and and there there's two separate issues there. I mean, one is one is the cost of attending, and to some extent, with regard, and, and again, I'm I'm not insensitive to the to the idea that attending a meeting is costly. Um, that that it it can be. Um, I don't think in the overall scope of your legal budget, that's a that's the biggest percentage of where you're spending your legal dollars and we can get into that I'm sure we will um, so I don't I don't think that attending of the meetings is a is a is the is really a huge in terms of the overall cost cost um, but in terms of just the the there's two issues one is one is being involved with staff to have input as far as like awareness and a lot of times like I'll give you an example and I'm going to kind of segue a second off the point but like uh, on agenda items to begin with. So a lot of times I'll get consulted with by staff for form or content of things that are actually going to be put on the agenda. Um, uh, drafting of resolutions, framing of agenda items properly to make sure that we're not saying something or putting something out that maybe might have some other consequence legally. Um, a lot of times staff will consult with me on things like that before the agenda to kind of pre-screen those items. You may not even see them. You may not even realize that there was a legal issue or that there could potentially be a legal issue because you never really see that. Um, but that does happen. Um, uh, but in terms of the – so coming back, as, as far as the – and so I'll give my input, and I will work with staff on those issues, you know, from the legal end. As far as giving my input or suggestions or anything as far as policy goes, um, uh, I try to limit – and, I'm, and I understand what you're saying as far as where the role of the legal advisor is and where it should be. Um, I don't try to influence policy. I don't try to influence you all politically. If you if you have particular things that you want to accomplish or positions that you take, whatever the will of the board is collectively, I'm here to ensure that what you're doing is legal and to give you the best advice from a legal aspect of how to get where you want to get or not to run afoul of certain applicable statutes or the charter or DOR or whatever is applicable. I, I have no stake in this. I have no I have no no personal interest in how things work out that's up to you all how you run your district is up to you i don't i don't you know that that's not my role and i and i try very hard not to involve myself in but that but on a couple of occasions you've you've suggested to residents of how they can appeal to this board or that they should appeal to this board can i if i could explain that i'll i'll tell you the one the one particular instance that i can recall of giving somebody advice was there was a woman who had showed up who had either an arc permit issue, a denial, I think, or a, it was a enforcement issue. I think it was an arc denial, if I'm not mistaken, that one woman that showed up it, who had been, who had, who the staff had said, if you don't resolve this properly, you're going to get a violation. If I'm, if I remember right, she was here in front of the board trying to have the board address her issue and it wasn't the proper forum for it the way that she had to there was a there was a procedural process that she was she was ahead of the game on and when i gave my input on to her it was not to tell her what to do to give her advice that would benefit her it was to try to put her in the proper framework in the proper box so that she could get here on a, a proper appeal if that's what her issue was but, but so it was also uh, the, the issue we're talking about that started me looking into this and I, I don't, I'm not the only one thinking any of these things and if mm -hmm. I am that's fine I'm wrong th th a few months ago you wrote a letter to a lady actually and told her how to appeal and what to appeal and that you would support her appeal at the meeting I don't remember which. And, and I, I don't remember which yeah, one. And that I, was. I don't need. I don't mean to get it, but but there yeah. wasn't a letter like that. And I know I talked to John about it, and I thought, you know, what what is this all about? This isn't 
what legal should be doing. Mo but I'm just simply saying you have to. There's a fine line between that and everything, and I know it's hard to to walk that line. But uh, my interest, and and just understand this, my interest at at the at the beginning, middle, and end of my representation of this district is to protect the district, and to and to protect you all as a board legally, and I have no other interest than that. So that's, that, that is where my focus is. If I am giving a resident advice on how to do something procedurally, or I am making a suggestion, and, and we can get into some of the nuances in, it, in, the, in the litigation type uh, context, and I think we will in, in a few minutes, but there are times where I may have to, cons or where I may have to have a discussion with someone who's represented pro se, and tell them certain things about their case or the posture of the case or how to resolve a case and how to work with staff. And, and yes, I will try to encourage people to do certain things that need to be done for the benefit of the district and resolving matters and resolving cases. So, uh, you know, I, I, there, there is a crossover line where you have to have some level of communication with people on issues. Um, but, but, but rest assured, <laughs> when I'm talking to a resident, um, I'm doing it in a way that is for the benefit of the district legally and to try to protect the, di the district's legal interests, and that's it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't involve myself in any other policy-type decisions. Um, and to that end, I, I might say that part of this discussion and part of billing and part of overall cost has to do with, like, individual communication with trustees or residents. Um, we have from time to time addressed that issue um, over the years. Um, I believe, although I didn't see it in the rules, I believe there was a policy that was adopted at one point in time that if a trustee wanted to contact legal, that they go through the chair and that they advise the chair that they were going to contact me for whatever reason um and just kind of get the chair's blessing on that do we um, do that is that john we, is that in out there no um that i think predates me um, we, we had we had done that in the past um and normally that's done as a cost saving mechanism so that everybody's aware and normally the the, the but the point is over the last 14 years, we really haven't had a lot of those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like this is really the first. <laughs> this is the first time that, and and again, not to say you're wrong to to visit it because they're your expenses and you have every right to to visit it. But we really haven't had a huge problem with legal expenses from a standpoint of me communicating with individual trustees or residents independently. I really limit those communications. If I have to talk to a resident, if a resident calls me with an issue. And, and or something that they're having a problem with resolving. And I think I can give them guidance that might put them in the right place to get them to staff or so they're not going to take some adverse action that's going to reflect negatively on the district or something. I might have a communication with them. I will from time to time talk to people to tell them, well, you know, this is probably the right course of action or not, or here's, here's how you procedurally get to where you want to get, um, or, dis or if somebody's got an issue with staff that I think, hey, it would be a benefit for me to hear what this person has to say so that I can relay it to staff so they know what's going on, then yeah, I might have a communication with somebody. But those are very, very few and far between interactions with individual residents. I rarely have those discussions. Trustees, every now and again, a trustee will call me. Um, from time to time, I have had communications with some of you. Um, this is pro this board itself is probably the board that I've had the least amount of individual contact with in, in quite some time. Um, so there have been times where we have had, an, and sometimes a trust, uh, one individual trustee is concerned about something that they want to address before a meeting, or maybe there's something they're going to raise in a meeting, um, and they want to talk to me first before they do it. Um, you know, we've done that, but those Again, those have been very limited. So, um, so we have no rules. We have no rules or policies or guidelines that we use uh, having to do with that. No, it, role, right, John? No, the la and it it wasn't formalized, I believe, in the rules of the BOT. But um, probably about four years ago, um, there was an issue with a a certain resident just constantly contacting Cliff and the 
the board had made a motion at the time that only the five of you or myself could authorize uh, Cliff to talk with a resident um, outside of like DOR enforcement and bill us for it because we were having people just randomly calling Cliff up and peppering him with a lot of questions and stuff. But um, that's uh, the only thing I recall. Um, one, one of the things for the, the history's sake is, um, and this is not meant to be taken good or bad, but just an observation, um, eight, eight years ago and beyond, we had a very strong-willed chairman. So the concept that a trustee would clear it with the chairman to speak with Cliff is not unreasonable in that era because we had a very strong-willed chairman at the time. Um, and, and Cliff, I know, so, so the way we run, anybody else just jump in, you know, um, the way we run our business every day, um, do we, I, I, I guess I'm trying to understand too from John, from you, and from staff. So do we run everything we do by legal before we do it? Uh, give me an example. As, as I go through all these things and I'm looking at this, and then, you know, I, we, we passed a thing the other day to increase the softball thing by a certain amount of money to do the guy, to pay the guy uh, the, the over 60 softball league, right? Yeah. So we, 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 we did something the other day, a simple agenda item, but when you look on the bills, there's $490 worth of bills to Cliff to talk about the softball league uh, on that thing. I don't understand something like that. Well, that one there, um, we have a... Um, we have a... Um, a contractual agreement with the organization. And so that was part of the issue um, with um, ha having Cliff involved in that. Because it is rather unique that you have a contractual relationship with an entity for services, and yet you pay their people directly. And so it, it gets into, are they covered under our workers' comp or not? And so that's part of that. Um, not everything runs through Cliff. Um, thing, uh, the reason we have two managers here are because nature of uh, resident relations, DOR and HR, and finance, um, Charles and uh, Rich are the most likely to call Cliff independently. Um, most times, not always, but most times it's an issue that we have, you know, briefly talked about and you know those gentlemen are sitting out there right now saying if I only had a nickel for every time he said have you talked to Cliff about this because um, we we have done very good in our workers comp and liabilities since I've been here of not having significant payouts and part of that I believe is because we address things early on um, each of my managers, I try to get them to focus on their area of responsibility. Uh, so, you know, Charles, that's, you know, being the finance person, our accounting, um, and, you know, managing the shopping center. He also understands that transparency and other goals and objectives overarching are important to me because I believe it's important to the community and he works on those but those aren't his areas of expertise so as he has moved to put more and more on our website some of the ideas he's had I've asked him to run by Cliff to make sure that Cliff doesn't see any potential issue because it's real easy to say um, the delinquent accounts is a public document well it's another thing to put on the internet everybody who owes us money because what happens if we have made a mistake with one person's account? It's sort of like we had a, we had a security committee years ago that Cliff didn't go to. And um, we had a, tr a, a uh, trustee who was the liaison of the committee. Cliff had to intercede twice and write apology letters and smooth over because we had legal liability from what 
advisory committees had said about residents that um, is an example of why I instruct my staff, when in doubt, ask Cliff the legal aspect. Okay, where are we going now? Well, I'll well, also say I, that again. I, I I understand that, and I I guess I I, I understand the, the the so afraid if somebody's going to file a lawsuit, but everybody in the world thinks they have their own personal lawyer, and everybody thinks they're going to get an attorney and they're going to file a lawsuit. And the question is, it just doesn't happen that often. I mean, they they lawyers will attorneys will say, fine, I'll write a letter on your behalf, but they know when they can do something, when they can't. So. I guess I do understand that, and it's good to be cautious. Um, but, but again, you look back, you put it all in perspective as to our budget, and I guess we're not hurting for money, so I guess the point is, you know, why are we even looking at it? But well, the, the, the other thing I'll say is I, I don't actively go looking for issues. Oh, I understand it. By you the know, way, like I'm not sitting at my desk that. going, how can, I, how can I generate more billable hours no, today from Verifa Bay? I, I, if I get a call from John... <laughs> I'm picking up the call, and I'm going to address his issue because he needs help, exactly. you know, or I staff needs that. help. So, I mean, just understand these are issues that staff feels are important enough that they need to bring me into the to the discussion point. If it's something that we can get into and get out of quickly, I'll tell them. And there's a number of times where John or Charles or Rich or I or have, and, and I will have a conversation, and it'll be relatively quick. It's like, hey, is this an issue? No, I don't see that as an issue. Okay, good. That's and and that issue's gone. Um, you know, so uh, uh, you know we try to move in and out of those issues quickly. But um, and 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 John's point is also a good one. I, I'm not at all taking any credit for it at all. But you've been very fortunate over the last uh, uh, decade or so um, of not having major league problem. Uh, litigation as far as any kind of liability issues, um, problems. We've been really good at avoiding those kind of things, contractual disputes. Um, um, you know, you really haven't seen any major problematic legal issue over the last, the, over the long, the, the period of time that I've been there. When I first got here, there were some pretty big issues, but once we kind of stabilize things there has not been many big issues and, and so. cliff again i agree completely this is not you mm -hmm. I, I mentioned right. this a couple of other meetings before this is not a criticism of you going and trying to drum up business this is more of how we use legal and whether or not we agree that that's how it should be oh. uh, again um it may very well be i'm as i look at it i'm just not used to Every time we get a FOIA request, we go to an attorney and mm -hmm. have them. I mean, we have policies on FOIA. We send them, we send them out, and that's the way it is. If somebody doesn't agree with it, they can come back and you say, oops, and you send them what they want because you didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I, I, all I'm saying is, in my perspective, I just was not used to using legal in those ways. Yeah. We, we do want to talk, and uh, Tom, I'm going to ask you in a minute. You can speak. Uh, we do want to talk and go on and talk about what it is we do, though, that's a little bit different. What do we do with DOR and some of the cases mm -hmm. and the beach thing and everything we're doing that is costing us so much money? And and are we are, are we approaching these things the way we should be and using our legal services and what is it getting us? I guess is my question. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if other people have questions about that or not. But to stop, unless somebody else has a question here right now, I have Tom Gunther here. And he had put a thing in for audience participation. So we'll let Tom get up and say a few words right now if he wants. This is a workshop, so we're kind of open. Tom, tell us your address, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I should know that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom gets the 1071 Royal Palm Drive. Um, I heard. I just recently heard about this, and quite honestly, I have not been involved in it, Board of Trustees matters, for four or five years, as you most know. I was before that uh, chairman on that board, uh, on your board, for uh, several years, and I just wanted to point out that uh, Cliff, of course, uh, attended those meetings, and we used Cliff's services, um, and I think it's, they're very invaluable. I think... You can't put a price on it. If you were going to put a price on it, the one thing I would say is I have reviewed 
or had at that time reviewed Cliff's contracts and it's one of the best deals in town and I, I think you have to overcome the fact uh, of saving some money uh, because you have to be care- very careful about uh, what can occur at a meeting, what, uh, what residents think, what residents feel that they want to do and you need some uh, feedback from an attorney um, actually whether you like it or not and um, the cost is nowhere near um, what the cost would be if somebody uh, uh, took, a, took exception to something the board did. Um, I'm sure Mr. Coffey's probably giving you some examples of what can happen and um, you're really uh, looking at Cliff especially uh, in some of these uh, uh, items as being an insurance uh, policy, an insurance policy for the board, an insurance policy for Barefoot Bay. If you get one thing that goes really bad, you, of course, understand how expensive that can be. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, where are we going now? Questions, Mr. Nugent? I just have a question uh, for Cliff. Um, not been on the board very long, and what I've done is rather than contact you directly, I will contact John, run the issue by him, and he'll make a decision whether or not legal needs to get involved. Some of my questions I'm sure have come up in the past seven and a half years that between you and John, you've had them answered, so I get my answer from John instead of calling you directly. Um, second is, I wish there were a way that we could get the contracts back to us, to the table for signature, faster than we have been getting them. We're still waiting for the steward medical lease. That's costing us money because until that's signed, they have a three-month grace period before they start paying lease. Right. Uh, is, is there a way we can get stuff done faster? Yeah, and that, that's one of the things that I've been working on, and hopefully we, you know, and that's part of the reason why we're bringing, I brought Krista into the fold more is to try to help out with some of the more routine issues so that I can focus on more of the detailed issues that you want to have right, um, like the Stewart Medical contract. So that's one of the things that we're working on, and that's why, um, you know, we've tried to, tried to, uh, 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 improve that level of service um um and so that i'm definitely cognizant of that issue for sure um, especially the, the big term contracts of course you want to have them right but i'd rather push out a right a contract that's got everything right than push it out just for the sake of speed but i realize there's a balance there so yep on now, some of these uh, if you have other clients too yes you have, you have many other clients too not just barefoot bank a few. No, yeah, you're you're about. I would say Barefoot Bay. Um, well, you, you're definitely a, a, a large client uh, 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 for sure, um, but you're probably not more than thirty percent of my available time client and, base. And 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 on, uh, you know, Jim is brings up a point, I guess, and that's the other thing. I think I'm not sure if we want to talk about it or not. Of 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 the kinds of cases and filings we do and. You know, we just went through a case recently where all of a sudden we had to say, well, okay, we just dropped the thing because we didn't win the case, and even if we won it, we couldn't have got money from her anyway, but we spent thousands of dollars on it. Right. I mean, I mean, it, it comes to the question again, you know, we're, we're, we're talking well, about the beach pilings. In just one month, you know, there's, there's, there's $1,200 in calls and emails on your, on your billings mm-hmm. for just one month and we've been going for months and months and months on this thing and we still don't have a beach restroom up that, that so has my question is is you know are, are we doing the right things i mean spending our money wisely the, there's not and, and again you, it, it would be wrong to try to draw parallels between any particular I, issue I so i can't tell you that every issue has been handled in the most time efficient the most economical way i mean there may be i mean if there's obviously strategy decisions you make every step of the way in every different type of issue and and some you handle better than others um uh, the case that you're talking about obviously long-term um issue that quite 
candidly, I was not in favor of the district beginning in the first place, um, but the district kind of went down that road, and and um, the case was not really a great case to begin with. Um, so that's kind of a unique situation. The the um, the beach issue has been very complicated. Um, you've got two engineering experts who basically took opposing positions on an issue, um, or at least weren't completely in the same uh, 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 mindset as far as how to resolve an issue. And we kind of got caught in the middle of that because we were tasked with trying to find a solution that worked for the district. I think we're there now, but it took us kind of a roundabout route to get there. And I had to be involved in those discussions because I had to give guidance as far as what I felt was the proper resolution and, and where to be. And so, you know, John will tell you, he was involved in those conversations and we had quite a few of them trying to get to the right place. So, I mean, that, that, and I don't think those two issues are really um, comparable at all, but um, but anyway, yeah, there's going to be some issues that are more costly than others. And, and again, I try to resolve issues as quickly as possible. Um, um, you know, I, I, I don't... I don't look at the district as any different than any other client that I have. I can tell you that. Like, as far as um, the rate, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll say the rate has been the same for 14 years. Right. I was going to mention okay. that, by the You're, way. Yeah, it the hasn't hour, changed. The hourly rate that I charge to Barefoot Bay is half of my normal hourly rate, just to let you know. So, but, but even that being said, I'm not... I, I don't view those I, – I view – in fact, I view the calls from staff and Mr. Coffey and the trustees as more important than any other client because you're my biggest, longing, longest standing client, and I take those calls. I, 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 think, I think Mr. Coffey and staff will probably tell you I'm, sometimes if I'm not available, I'm not available, but I normally get back pretty quick uh, if somebody leaves me a message or a call. I, it tip, it's, it's very rare that it would go more than a day that I don't call somebody back if you leave me a message. I, I normally am very attentive to those issues. Um, and so I'm not pushing Barefoot Bay to the side, I can assure you, um, def, despite the fact that the rate is lower. Um, um, so that's, I mean, that's just a whole, that's just a side point. In terms of how you handle things, and I mean, we can get into a more involved discussion about litigation. Um, I think the DOR is probably the biggest and, and we'll talk about the issue. DOR in a minute to, to um, talk about get an and idea I can that, yeah. I can address that. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into that right now, but well, I, we do we do, Cliff. But 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 uh, again, not to beat a dead horse, you, you can understand, I guess, from our perspective. Uh, I understand that, that these things take a lot of time and everything, but you can understand from our perspective as we look at something and you have, and not that I worry about what residents come up and say, but as an example, the pilings. You know, this has been months and months and months now since we knew we may have to put pilings in. And we actually passed a motion on this board, you know what, no matter what, even if we don't get a waiver or, or a variance, whatever, we're going to put the pilings in. Right. And we're still going on and people ask, Ask, well, where, what's with the beach? What's with the beach? What's with the pilings? And you look back at month and month, and again, when I go back and say, well, geez, we just spent $1,200 just on phone calls this month on the pilings. Yeah. You can understand how, from our perspective, you sit there and say, what are we doing? What, are, are we doing this wisely? Are we spending yeah. our money wisely? I know it may take all of that. I'm not saying it does it. It's just that mm -hmm. when you look at it and you say, my goodness, we're spending thousands of dollars, and we don't even have a waiver yet. Yeah. Um, no, I understand that. I understand that. I, I, I don't know what to tell you about that other than to say I, I that, that was an involved process. And, and to the extent it matters, I mean, we got the final opinion from the, from the engineer. I think it was the first week of May that we actually got that final opinion. So we've been working on the solution since then. So Can we talk? Yeah. Uh, I know the question is by board about this right now. I, I want to talk about the DOR and about cases and a little bit about it, get a better understanding, unless you have something else we're talking about. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd just like some clarification. Uh, I'd like to make some clarification rather uh, than have clarification. I know that we use the term we when we talk about the board, and I will, I don't mind being the lawn ducks sitting here going, look, I don't like the price of my electricity, but I pay for it because I need my lights on. I don't like the price of legal, but we pay for it because we need legal. I do not stand with the board. Uh, if, if the board is a we and they're saying 
we have questions on this. Cliff, I, I in no way question what you do, and if I do have a question on something, I have uh, made a call and uh, asked you, and you've always satisfied those questions. So by no means am I sitting here uh, as, a, as a part of this, and what this is really feeling a little bit like to me is uh, an inquisition, and I do, I agree. We've got every right to ask questions about billing, um, I see the billing uh, every time it comes in. I read through it every time it comes in, and Cliff will tell you I've found only one in the two and a half years that I've been looking at reviewing the billing. I found only one error, and Cliff's company quickly corrected that. Um, so I, I've got to tell you, I, I'm not part of this. I don't agree with this. I don't. I, I'm not even comfortable sitting here with no. it. So, Cliff, you've done a great job, and I appreciate you. I just wanted to say a couple things. I think you have an attorney as part of the team. And part of the team is, do we have errors of omission? In other words, is there something that we didn't catch that a legal beagle would catch that keeps us out of trouble? Second of all, do we have errors of commission? As in, are we going to do something that's going to harm somebody? And then the third part of this is something I always used to teach my paramedics. If it was foreseeable, it was preventable. And certainly I am no legal expert, and I would expect Cliff to say, you know what, if you go down this road, something might come up, or, you know, uh, what was the ripple effect, or something along those ideas. Um, I see legal as a cost of doing business. Now, I'm not in disagreement with Chair and Mino as far as are there ways we can maybe slim it down or have a better procedure or something like that. But I think if you look at counsel, counsel has been the one constant in the Barefoot Bay. He's been here 14 years. Who on the board's been here 14 years? What community manager's been here 14 years? Uh, who in our staff has been here 14 years? So... I think what I'm saying is, and I'm sort of agreeing with Randy, is I think we need to take a look, but be careful where we throw the stone. And, and thank you. And, and I, I agree, you know, um, two points. One, I also pay electric bills. And every time my electric bills get high, I look at them and say, how can I change that and, and have these electric bills get lower? Number one. Number two, um, you're right. Uh, Cliff has been here for 14 years, and part of this is to make sure that he is, in fact, serving us as a legal representative and not as a staff member or as a board of trustee member. If that's wrong, it's, it's too bad. That's the way I feel, mm -hmm. and, and I did want to sit here and go through these things to get a better understanding. I've told him many times I'm not in any way against Cliff or his representation, but if you're going to sit as a board member and you're going to look at budgets, then you look at everything in those budgets. And if, if it's the, okay the way it is and the, pro, the procedures are proper, then that's what you do. If it's not, then you change it. Um, I do want to talk about DOR cases and have you explain to us a little bit more about exactly what it is, what it is we do. We do two ways with cases. One we put a lien on something and the other ones go to you and you do something. Can you briefly tell us how that works again and, and what we get from it? Yes. What do we get out of it? And at the outset, let me just say, I don't take any of this personally and I don't, and it and, and I don't, and I don't think that you do not, I, I believe that the board has every right to question every single expense that you have, legal or non-legal. So you've got a finite but, uh, 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 source of revenue and, a, and, a, and an extremely tight budget, and you've got every right to, to, to question how your dollars are being spent. So th there's absolutely no problem with that from my perspective. Um, as far as the DOR cases go, um, the, you have to go back in time to kind of understand how the DOR evolved to where it is right now. And and without going too far astray, I'll tell you that it, when I initially came into the district, and some of you may know this story and some of you may not know it, um, the district was, was operating its DOR enforcement 
akin to code and municipal code enforcement. That's how it used to operate. It used to have a series of resolutions that would um, that would run a violation through the violation committee and then assess a fine, findings of fact, uh, conclusions of law, order, and fine, and begin fining a property. And at a certain point, the DOR enforcement would then place a lien on the property. And you had, I, I want to say hundreds of liens, but I don't know, that might be overstating it. It was, it was, a, it was a lot of liens that you had that were recorded. And when I initially came in, um, one of the, the the lawsuit that I got handed walking in the door was an individual who had sued the district because because you had and, and the district and when I say you I mean the board the district had hundreds of thousands of dollars of unpaid liens recorded against property hundreds of thousands of dollars it may have been in the millions it was hundreds of thousands of dollars recorded against these properties. And this one particular individual had, I believe it was $100,000 of liens individually against his property because the fines were not limited. The fines were not capped, and they just kept running. And so you had these these fines that were, uh, these liens that were out there. So this individual had sued the district um, to invalidate the lien that had been recorded against his property. Um, and it was a fairly significant case, and uh, it was o- and it all started over a lamppost violation. And we the case uh, it went through some discovery, and then we went to mediation. And at mediation, we had made some assertions uh, the district had um, that we had a right to lean um, under essentially our own charter power, home rule power, and the. And the mediator, after reading our briefs and looking at it independently, said, you guys are in big trouble in this case, and you really need to um, um, uh, uh, reverse your position on this. Um, And I I took that very seriously because the consequences of having these hundreds of thousands of dollars um, um, burdening properties was fairly significant. Um, And we... uh, What's important to realize is that there was an attorney general opinion that had come out before under your prior when your prior counsel was here um, that said that recreation mobile home park recreation district could not uh, utilize chapter 162 for purposes of its DOR enforcement and so it specifically addressed that issue and yet uh, former counsel decided that they would try to create a resolution that kind of got around that issue and it really didn't address it didn't get around that issue it actually made the issue much worse um and was completely directly contradictory to what the ago said um and so we wound up settling that case and as part of the settlement of that case um we the district agreed uh, as approved by the Board of Trustees, that we would release all of the existing code inf- or <laughs> code. I'm, I'm even calling it code enforcement. Everyone at the time called it code enforcement. Um, uh, that they would release all the deed of restriction enforcement liens, um, and that we would rewrite the district's enforcement policies um, to take the finding structure out of the uh, uh, DOR enforcement process. And so that's what happened, and that's how we rewrote the resolutions to provide that instead of stopping at the administrative level with a fine and a lien, that we would adhere to what the DOR said, which was to bring equitable and legal actions against the properties at the end of the road. That was the final step, was that you could run it through the administrative process, you couldn't fine, but then you could go into the legal process if you wanted to after that. And that's what the, that's what the deed of restrictions expressly says right now. Um, and so that's how you got where you got. And so you've got a number of these cases that are uh, what what we do when we fi- when we get referred a case, it's a dual action, a two count action. One is for the court to declare that a property is in violation, and the other is to uh, uh, enter an injunction uh, to uh, 
to 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 require the owner to bring the property into compliance. Um, a good example, and we just happen to have a relatively new good example of that, is in the case that was just decided uh, two weeks ago, which is the uh, the case involving the three dogs. And the court did, in fact, we, we ran that case as far as we could. We got to a final judgment point, and the court said, okay, I'm going to declare you in violation. You got three dogs, and I'm going to enjoin you and require you to come into compliance. And that's what the court has done in that case. We have a number of cases. At, I think there's there's 22 cases, I think, on the list. Um, there's a lot of them that are getting to that stage of the final proceeding. So we're coming forward with quite a few of them that are going to be... How long does that normally take? It depends. And I'll give you, I'm going to give you an example of what can happen in a case. But, but it depends on whether the owner files a response or not, because these are, these are lawsuits just like any other case. Um, you can, an owner can file, can, can get legal counsel. They can file an answer. They can challenge the validity of the district to actually enforce its own DOR. They can challenge legally the, the validity of the DOR itself. They can challenge the matter factually, in which case we have to go to a full trial on it with full discovery and everything. So they're not, it's not like, you know, everybody likes to maybe think about it simplistically in, in your heads about how these cases proceed and that, you know, okay, we've got a violation of the DOR. It's pretty cut and dry. Let's just write a letter to the judge and have them find them in violation. Well, that's not the way it works. We have to, we have to, it's very, it's, it's, it's a very detailed, uh, cumbersome process of filing pleadings and getting it into proper posture, just like any other lawsuit, going through discovery, going through the pre-motion uh, calendars and, and hearings, and then getting to a final judgment point. So, I mean, they're just like any other litigation case. As another little segue, I'll tell you, so the district is involved in a, litig in a litigation matter on a, on, a, on a liability issue that we don't need to get into today um, that, it, that you've had claims counsel appointed on uh, by your insurance carrier, by the League of Cities, has appointed claims counsel. And the legal advisor for that case gave a legal budget last week, and the legal budget to the, to the League was like $108,000. And that was for one case, for one liability case. And it kind of struck me because I was like, you know, it's interesting that uh, the legal budget for this case is $100,000. And yet, in any one DOR enforcement case, we could be going to trial just like this litigation case is going to trial. And we've got 22 of them sitting here, you know, in, in the same posture. And it's just kind of interesting to me that that's the potential exposure of expenditure on a litigation case. Now, to date, we haven't had anywhere near anything like that on a DOR enforcement case, and we try to limit them, to, for the most part, the expenses on them. Um, they can get into the five, $6,000 range, but they typically don't get a lot higher than that before we get to a final judgment. Um, so, I mean, we're nowhere near that. But if we went to trial on a case, yeah, we could st start incurring some real costs on a, on a trial. And a judgment um, is that the court makes them come into compliance or well, simply that the lien goes on the home? Well, no, there is no lien. So, so think, let's go back to the dog case now. So in the dog case, we've just gotten the final judgment. So, or we've gotten the order that we need to convert to the final judgment. Nevertheless, the court has entered the order saying that they're in violation, entering an injunction. So owner has 30 days to bring the property into compliance. If owner doesn't bring the property into compliance, and that's probably a, a very involved discussion about how we determine when, whether owner's in compliance, we would file a motion to compel with the court. And we'll bring them back to the court, and the court will, they'll have to answer to the court on an order to show cause as to why they haven't brought the property into compliance. And then the court can make a determination on what the appropriate resolution or sanction is in that case. Um, that's, a, that's a perfect example of what you're achieving in these cases if you're achieving something is you've got a court with oversight over the matter. And in this case, I will tell you, uh, although the judge was uh, uh, somewhat conflicted in terms of his own personal feelings about the matter, he realized that his hands were legally tied and that, and that the court and court basically acknowledged as such that the court had no option but to enter the order that we were asking for. Um, 
I don't know what the court's going to do with it if it comes back on a contempt motion. I have no idea. The court will get to make that determination. But, but ultimately what you're achieving is you're achieving a court oversight of telling an owner, okay, you're not in compliance. You need to get into compliance, and here's how I'm going to make you get into compliance. I'm either going to fine you myself with judicial sanctions monetarily or I'm going to throw you in jail until you come into compliance. It could be a criminal contempt motion because it's a violation of a direct order. We don't know because we've never gotten to that point where an owner hasn't brought a property into compliance. Um, but we're getting close. We've been close once before, and now we're getting close again because if this property doesn't come into compliance, we'll do the same thing. We'll file, an or we'll file a, a motion for contempt, and, and, and we'll see what the court does with it. That's where all these cases are headed. All of these cases are headed to that same point. Um, um, so, question for you, John. On, on those kinds of cases, are those people also lost their their privileges? Uh, correct. And uh, this, this goes back to a, a case that had been going a couple years when I got here. But and when I say this number. Cliff will cringe, but 491 papaya is seared into our memories because it was a a, a real uh, it was a debris issue dealing with an animal, and the neighbors were upset. I'll leave it at that. You can imagine make imagine the animal wasn't outside all the time, but what they leave was left for periods of time. It took to getting to the threat of going to jail for that person to clean up their carport. And so if you remember the uh, audience participation of the last meeting, we'll probably have that again even worse uh, if we get to the point of asking the judge to threaten to find her in contempt because in my opinion, um, threat of going to jail is the only thing going to do that. Ironically, um, the the husband of the person who spoke was driving around spotted recently with the three dogs in the golf cart. So although, um, you know, she has that outplay and, you know, nobody in staff with the trustees, you know, likes the situation. But what's not brought up recently is when you move into a DOR community, you should understand the DOR and abide by it. And if you can't abide by it, don't move into the community. Their story, uh, just digress for a moment, they each lived separately and they each had two dogs. That's the point this went haywire, not anything staff did. They should have realized their plan to join uh, lives together wasn't compatible with Barefoot Bay. And so it's not us being the meanies of getting rid of the dogs. They have an option of moving, too. And it sounds harsh, but every HOA is different, and uh, people need to understand going in, we're not going to adjust our HOA just because you don't like one aspect right. of it. But, well, but no, and not to talk about that case specifically, but again, we'll use it as an example. Mm -hmm. So if you go back and look at that, you know, this all started like 2017, I believe. I mean, it's, it's been many years. My question again is, we probably went through a process where they got the letter notification saying this is wrong. Then did we go to the whole thing? Okay, after no compliance, after 30 days, you lose privileges and so, et cetera, et cetera. So have these people, for instance, not had privileges for all these years? Uh, they, they were found in violation by the violation committee. The, this board, um, referred it to Cliff. Um, at, Rich can tell you the specific instance the suspension takes hold, but at that time period, since Cliff's had involved, they have been in suspension. And uh, technically, the, the husband shouldn't be riding his golf cart on our common area, but yeah. that again goes, we're not going to call the deputies every time um, he's driving by because by the time he gets here, he's off our common area and back in the street sure. with the three under, dogs. 
under your DOR enforcement process, when a when a person is found in violation at the violation committee stage, at that point the privileges are right. suspended. So yeah, so that you've got a number of different tools in your arsenal. Right. That's one. And, that, of them. and that's kind of what I'm trying to understand that, how we work it. What, what do you do about you have a case there, for instance, where it's it's one of your cases going to court and. There are no owners. They can't find the owner. Yeah. I mean, how well, long do let, we go? What do we do with something okay, like that? Okay, so how I'll address. going? I'll address that head on. That that's a good that's a good example because I was kind of going into another area. But uh, yeah, those are problematic cases. I mean, you've got and and there's quite a few. I mean, Rich can address it if he wants to. But there's quite a few cases. You're not seeing as many of them now as you saw a while back when the foreclosure crisis was really at its peak. I don't, I, don't think there, I don't think there's many out there. Um, property turnover seems to be relatively good, and so you're not really seeing a lot of absentee owners. But every once in a while, you'll have a property where somebody dies is probably the best example. Maybe you've got a, somebody who uh, the, the property's not in compliance, the owner is deceased. We've got a couple of those on our list. Um, the, there's no estate that's open on the property. There's no one that's claiming ownership of the property. Um, we've got it, and if we if we there's no there's either one if we haven't filed a litigation case on it, well, there's nobody to serve, so we can't. So it just kind of sits there because there's no one to really serve process on. Um, if it's a bank that has title to it, maybe they're not gonna be as respond. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. If they're out of state, it it depends. Um, but assuming that we can get service. Um, sometimes a lot of them are defaults. So a lot of the cases you'll have nobody files a response. And so we'll go into the court and we'll ask the court, hey, enter a final judgment. Well, if the court enters a final judgment and there's no one, let's say it's an out-of-state owner that we get service on, but they don't care, they don't, they don't care, then the court can enter an injunction if it wants to, but the property's still not going to come into compliance because there's nobody there that's going to be responsive. The dog case is the best case scenario for somebody who is potentially responsive to the court because they've appeared in the case, they're active in the case, the court has rendered the order, the court has jurisdiction over them, and if they don't comply, the court's going to do something about it. Um, so if somebody, you know, th th those are the best case scenarios, but I can't tell you that you're going to get responsiveness in every single case. Sometimes you do get to the end of the day and you've got a paper judgment and it's like, well, who is there to enforce against? Because there's nobody here. We try to use our best judgment as far as how we proceed on those cases. Um, and some of them like that, we don't have owners. Obviously we're not filing litigation cases on somebody who's not there. Um, so, you know, we're, we try to use our best judgment to get people when we can. Um, another problematic example, and we've talked about it, um, and this gets into the cost aspect of it, is something like a 1025 rent, where you have an owner who is, it, it, and we talked about this a little bit last time at our last meeting, um, you have an owner who the property was out of compliance, um, it's a widow on a limited income, um, has very limited resources, although I, don't pers I, I wasn't personally involved with her. I don't know her personal backstory. Um, uh, but you had the CVO who stepped up. We, we filed the suit. The CVO stepped up and, and um, offered to provide assistance to the resident and basically – shepherded the compliance issue and helped that owner bring their property into compliance. We had filed the lawsuit, we had served the lawsuit, and during the pendency of the resolution, we just kind of didn't do anything with as far as pushing an answer or defaults or anything like that because we knew that the CVO was going to help this owner bring it into compliance. Well, there's no point in us incurring additional expenses and costs unnecessarily for the district to push this through to a final judgment if we realize, hey, they're about to bring this property into compliance. We did get service, but um, let's not make the matters worse by trying to, you know, push this case or run up additional fees. We're going to let the property come into compliance. So property, CVO gets the property to come into compliance. Now she's in compliance. So now we're sitting on a lawsuit 
and under the DOR, what the DOR says is, and it's important distinction to keep in mind, is that not that you, not that the district is entitled to recover its costs in every case that it has. That's not what the, the DOR says. The DOR says the district can recover its legal fees and costs if it is successful in the litigation, if it a- obtains a final judgment that says that it was entitled to relief. So at the time that you know, just because we file a lawsuit doesn't necessarily mean that we have entitlement. We have to go earn entitlement. We have to ask the court to grant entitlement. In a case like that, so we've, we've got compliance now, and let's say, I, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I think it was somewhere in the $1,700, $1,800 range, okay, of legal fees and costs. So that's where you're at on that case. What we would have to do to pursue a judgment is to then prepare the proper motions, maybe amend the complaint because now we're in compliance, so we have to have the court make a finding that we were entitled to relief at the time that we filed the complaint, which is a different affidavit from staff that we need to prepare and then file a motion um, and get that in front of the court for a hearing. So you could spend you could spend up to $1,700 more to go into court, go get a final judgment, um, against that owner that is already in compliance that you know is indigent that you're not going to recover on to get a personal judgment against that owner you can't foreclose on the personal judgment you can get a judgment lien certificate and you record and you can record it and it would operate as a cloud on the title um but not necessarily as a as an enforceable lien that you could go foreclose so it's a personal judgment excuse me, against that owner. Um, Might you see a recovery of that? You might at some point in time in the future, um, but there's no guarantee of that, and you you may see pennies on the dollar of that judgment recovery. So, you know, did you get any value out of that case? Probably not. Probably not. Um, And so what's the value, what's the wisdom in moving forward to get a final judgment on fees and costs if you're not ever going to recover them? Probably not very wise. There may be some cases where you do, where you've incurred those cases and the owner has fought you every step of the way and it's a contentious case and you say, hey, you know what, we want to recover our fees and costs because we've gone all the way. The dog case is a great example. We're going to move for fees. I can guarantee you we're going to move for fees and costs in that case and we're going to push that case as far as we can push it because they're still in violation and they're still pushing the issue. But on a case like 1025 rent, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, And so that's why... When And again, we use discretion in trying to put those cases and bring those cases into the right posture. Um, but on a case like that, we would probably bring it to you and say, look, we think you ought to dismiss the case and, and not really push it forward because there's nothing more to gain in the case. You've pushed it as far as you can. Um, is there some intangible value to bringing these enforcement cases? I mean, is it – does it – I think it does help from a compliance aspect, the fact that we are filing lawsuits. I think they're, whether we're obtaining final judgments or not, I think people know that, we're, that we are actively pursuing these in litigation, and I do think it helps your compliance. And Rich can address that more in detail too, but I think we've seen a significant upswing in, in, uh, in compliance cases as we've increased the litigation efforts. Um, and I think when you see somebody who gets a final judgment against them, like the dog example, I think that does help set a good example for the community that other people are like, hey, we don't want to be in that position. So there, there's an intangible value there of having people, of knowing that people, uh, knowing that you have somewhat of a hammer to bring against them. Um, but, but again, in every case, you're probably not going to push it all the way to a final conclusion. Right. I'll give you one more example. Um, we have a case that I, I do have to address with you in a different context, and I, I won't raise the whole issue now, but we have a case where we filed a litigation case on a DOR claim. The, um, the owner hired a, a legal counsel, so there's a lawyer on the other side, they have not filed a response yet, but they did send us a letter, and they said that they had issues with the way that the um, – they raised two issues. They raised a notice issue, and they raised a um, 
a fact issue on the on the violation. They they were wrong on the notice issue. There was no problem with the notice, but as far as the compliance issue, they had a point on interpretation of compliance. And I've talked to staff about it, and staff agrees that yes, they. They technically they're in compliance. We're going to request that you dismiss that suit because there's attorney's fees on the other side. Um, so if we lose that case and there's a possibility of losing that case, the district can get assessed attorney's fees going the other way because they're reciprocal. Um, so we're going to ask you that you dismiss that case. Um, we probably won't do that tonight, but but you'll see that coming. Um, so so these are these are the kind of issues you get into in litigation. It's 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 complicated. Um, that being said, let me set all that aside for a second. And, and, and that's the process you've got right now. That's, it's the best you've got. Um, it doesn't make sense in all cases, but it does in some. That being said, we've looked at alternative ways of amending your process to maybe work finding back in. It wouldn't be the same concept that you were using, that the district was using before using 162. It would require a DOR amendment straight up. So you'd have to, because Holiday Park does fine, and they're the closest comparable example that we have. They fine, but the reason why they can fine, they don't rely on 162 to fine. They fine because their deed of restriction says that they can, and ours doesn't. Um, so we would need to put that out as a DOR amendment to allow for that to happen. I have been somewhat, I'm, I'm somewhat, I won't get into the legalities of it. I, I have some questions about legality, but I think you can get there. I've seen Holiday Park structure. We've looked at it. Um, I feel pretty comfortable with that as a finding structure. Um, I do think there's some questions. Uh, one of the reasons why is because, Unfortunately, the district kind of falls into this weird gap. You're not a municipality. You don't have home rule power. So you can't fall under 162, and that's what the AGO, that's what the AGO says. It says you're, because a special district is not a county or a city, you can't utilize 162 for enforcement purposes. Yet at the same time, you're charged under your, under your charter with enforcing the DOR but you're not an HOA. So you don't have the powers that an HOA has to enforce a deed of restrictions as an HOA does under 720, which they have finding authority under 720. So a couple of times, we've taken a couple of, of swings at trying to get legislative support over the years to amend our 418 so that we can amend the charter, so that the charter can be amended to make us akin to HOAs for enforcement purposes. Um, the two times that we've made it into having bills introduced, both of those times the bills have failed. Um, and so um, actually I think one of them was introduced. I'm not sure whether the other one even made it to being introduced. Um, but they have, they, those efforts have failed. And given the legislature's position on home rule power right now, I'm not real optimistic that we would be able to run a similar bill. So what I think, so, so it's kind of a weird issue as far as like the authority to find um, and where it comes from. But I do think if you had the same finding structure written into the DOR that Holiday Park has, I think you could probably go that route and then um, have a limited lien that you could apply that might be another step other than bringing a lawsuit. Um, Holiday Park does not bring litigation lawsuits. Their charter is different. Their, their, um, their DOR is different. They do not bring any lawsuits, um, unless it's something that's like a health, safety, welfare violation. But I've talked to their counsel, and they don't, that, that's not something that they think is, is productive, so they don't do it. Um, but they do fine and lean. Again, is that going to get you compliance? Um, and we and we lean, right? We don't lean. Uh, I what, we, what, what, there's a two part. There's a two track uh, uh, analysis for your DOR cases. One is when you have, and this is what the resolutions say: if you have an issue like lot mowing or power washing or debris removal that the district can go on because the right. the DOR says you can, and lean costs, 
then the district will, in cases, self-help right, right. on vacant properties or, or unoccupied properties and then lean those curative costs. So curative costs lean yes, fining lean no. So that's the difference. So you do have liens out there for curative costs, but not for fining. What we're talking about is fining. Is that going to improve your compliance? Um, uh, it's probably no greater of a hammer than anything else. If an owner's going to come into compliance, they're going to come into compliance. If they're not, they're probably right. not. Right. Um, but it might give you another might give you another avenue to pursue. I, you know, I, I'm open to that idea. If the district is open, but it would start with a DOR amendment that you'd have to then propose out to the residents, and they'd have to approve it, and that's where it would start. Um, so, but that that would get you out of the litigation context. Of course, you can scale those back too. I mean, you don't have yeah, to refer yeah. them all. So, I think it's good just to understand, have a better understanding, though, of how it goes and what we get. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's okay. that. Um, any other questions, comments? Um, again, I want to, uh, and I'll give audience participation a minute. Uh, I just want to make sure, uh, as we said before, and I agree, Cliff, this is not personal. It has nothing personal against you or John or staff. It's more to give a better understanding to me. I won't say the board, but to me, so that I do understand how all this works. I also agree, or I believe strongly, that this board as a trustee has a responsibility to review all of these programs and services and costs affected and and that if they have questions about policies or decisions or or expenditures that's absolutely our right and our and our responsibility to ask questions about those and to change things if it's necessary um, on the other hand I'm I'm only one board member I may or may not agree on how things are done certain things that doesn't mean I want to change them it's more that I want to understand them but I am only one board member, and uh, until things are come up that I really feel strongly about changing, it's just want to express my opinions. Um, I, I have no more questions or comments or anything about this. Uh, audience participation, anybody else want to speak about anything? Mr. Grun will say we should give a second chance. I'll go to our board now. Board members. I think violations has come a long way in the four years that I've been here. Um, we used to have agendas with 38 items on. Last couple agendas have been 20 or less. I think Rich and Mary have done a really good job in mitigating a lot of that before it even gets to the violation committee. Uh, the case on the dogs, that came up when I was a younger board member. And I think the board and Rich went out of their way to work with this issue. And I think we got to hold the legal a hammer back there because otherwise we won't get any kind of compliance. I do think that the fact that we have taken some legal action, even though it's been costly, I think we have helped things along in the fact that we don't have as many non-compliant cases. So um, right now I don't see that as a problem, Um, maybe a little bit of a cost, but I think uh, violations committee and violations uh, enforcement has really developed nicely over the last couple of years. Well, <clears throat> I think that um, as a board or as a homeowner, uh, we have an obligation to read the policies, the procedures, the manuals, the charter, understand the community that we live in. I think as a board, We have an obligation um, prior to sitting on this board, we have an obligation to understanding the procedural um, operation of the the bay, whether that means getting with Rich to understand how the DOR works, whether that means getting with John to understand how the hierarchy of of a um, management works, Kathy with food and beverage journey with the golf course, Matt with maintenance. Um, As a board, if we're going to oversee it, we need to understand it. Um, so we do, and I think that um, when there are um, discrepancies in our understanding, I think these workshops are a good thing. Um, today I had no discrepancy in my understanding of any of the topics that were, were brought up. I feel very fortunate in that, um, but I would recommend that anybody that takes this seat after I vacate it that they uh, educate themselves quickly on what the procedures are 
and what the process is, uh, not just in, in writing, but what the actual process is. Mr. Morrissey. This is, uh, hello. Are you in? <laughs> okay. Uh, today is very enlightening to me. I am very new to the board, as you know. Uh, a lot of things that uh, has gone on in the past I am not privy to. Uh, I had tried to get some information on a couple of issues. I was successful doing that. Uh, today, uh, I did have some questions about the cost of litigation uh, and legal services. Uh, but after hearing uh, Cliff and, uh, and the board members, uh, I'm very confident that, uh, and I know that he's doing a good job, and I don't know where we could have saved any money looking at the budget and looking at the actions in the past year, uh, the few months that I've been on the board. Um, Chris, you're doing a good job. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that uh, we have good counsel. And if there's any issues that come about, uh, from what I see, it's been handled professionally. And uh, uh, as far as uh, the DOR, uh, I had some uh, issues with the DOR enforcement because uh, I'm not, not the DOR itself, it's, it's the way that it has to be run because there's no teeth in it. Um, I thought to uh, perhaps look in an avenue that it could uh, have finding issues, you know, finding decisions and able to do so. But I see uh, that we're not allowed to do that. And, and thinking about going to the public or to these residents, I don't believe they would back something like that anyway. Uh, just the feeling that I have uh, nothing concrete or evidence to say that, but uh, that's my feeling of it. And I want to thank uh, Mike for bringing up such a uh, a robust meeting and on the issues, uh, and I agree with him uh, in, the, in the part that uh, it should be looked into and and find out where where the uh, costs are going, you know, and how long it takes. Uh, as far as the beach it was brought up to too, uh, that was my issue for a long since I've been on the board, uh, how we can get the uh, issues resolved and have it built and have it installed and and make the beach people, I call them, <laughs> and I'm one of them. I love the beach. Uh, to go down there and uh, be confident there be something there for us to relieve ourselves with. You know. But uh, I want to thank everybody here today for enlightening me. And, uh, and uh, that's all I have to say. Mr. Nugent. Uh, no, thank you. I had my questions answered. OK. Um, and again, I, I, I thank everyone for uh, participating and coming today and and um, we weren't here to make any decisions we weren't here to make any changes um, uh, just to get information and to discuss them and to bring points out so I do appreciate everyone participation um, any other issues for the board if not um, Cliff anything else if you have any questions about anything that's billed, feel free to contact me at any time. I'll, I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to answer a question or address any issues that you feel. And just rest assured that not only am I, am I committed to protecting the district and the board and making sure that everything you're doing is legal, I'm also very committed to trying to keep your costs down as much as I possibly can. Uh, I, I understand the limitations of, of your budget. and. And, and, I'm, and I'm certainly trying to do that as we go through the process. I will always advise you on what I think is the most economical way to move forward on legal issues. So just rest assured that I, I will do that. Thank you. Mr. Coffey, anything? Uh, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So move by Mr. Nugent. Meetings adjourn.